Hello and welcome to The Bar Report. In 1926, historian Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History announced that the second week of February would be declared as Negro History Week to coincide with Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass's birthday. Negro History Week morphed into Black History Month in 1970 due to a Black United Students Union proposal at Kent State University and black educators across the country. The idea was to use the month of February to highlight black Americans' accomplishments ordinarily rendered invisible in a country whose foundation was built on systemic racism. I want to talk to black people across this country. There are four things we have to do. Number one, we have to stop being ashamed of being black. We've got to stop being ashamed of being black. Number two, we have to move into a position where we can define terms for what we want them to be, not what racist white society wants it to be. We have to move to define. We have to move to a position where we can feel strength and unity amongst each other from watch to Harlem where we won't ever be afraid. And the last thing we have to do is to build a power base so strong in this country that will bring them to their knees every time they mess with us. It also emerged at the zenith of the black power movement in the country. On today's program, we will be highlighting some Caribbean Americans who contributes to black history every day. Following in the footsteps of thousands of immigrants from the Caribbean who started immigrating for better economic opportunities in the early 1940s as guest workers back then and who managed to establish cultural roots along the way. Heritage and to celebrate all of the immigrants who have come to this country from the Caribbean over the years and the contribution they have made to this country, whether it's food, culture, generals, teachers, lawyers, doctors, we should be so very proud of what the West Indian culture has done for America and what America has done for the West Indians who have come here. We also sit down with a Grenadian book author to discuss her experiences living in Asia as a black woman. We welcome our guests, Grenadian author Lynette Rooker, community activist Cassie Morris, Martin Felix, visual artist, educator, and writer, Felicia Nemhard, the mayor of New Carrollton in Maryland, and Aisha Braveboy, the state's attorney for the county of Prince George's in Maryland. Welcome to another episode of The Bub Report. Thanks for joining us. A pleasant good morning to everyone, uh, good night, or good evening, or whatever time you will be watching this program. Uh, in 1965, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Immigration and Nationality Act into law. The new Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 dispensed with the previous 1917 Act, which effectively banned Asian, Mexican, Caribbean, and Mediterranean people from entering the United States. Seven years later, Congress passed the Immigration Act of 1924, also known as the Asian Exclusion Act. The law created a quota system that prioritized immigrants from Northern and Western Europe, drastically restricting immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean. It also completely banned Arabs, Asians, and Indians. The law's stated purpose was to, quote, 
preserve the idea of American homogeneity, unquote. More than four decades later, the Immigration and Nationality Act was able to welcome throngs of Caribbean immigrants who call the United States home and have been woven into the tapestry of Black history. Later in our show, as we said in the intro, we are happy to be joined by a cadre of Caribbean American civic leaders to celebrate Black History Month. Caribbean immigrants also owe it to the civil rights movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and others for creating the enabling environment for the act to come in the Immigration and Nationality Act to come into force in the first place. But first, uh, I'm happy to be joined by Lynette Rooker. She is the author of uh, A Grenadian in Asia, How I Survived a Drug Plant, an Airport Taxi Abduction, and Lived to Write This Book. So let me welcome Miss Rooker to the Burb Report. Uh, welcome, Lynette. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. A fun fact before we get into the questioning, a lot of a lot of folks may may or may not know, but you are the sister of the late Sir Royston Hopkins. That's right. That's right. Unfortunately, we lost him a year ago, mm -hmm. very suddenly. And um, we're all still having a lot of uh, trouble uh, coming to terms with his death mm -hmm. because it was so unexpected. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Lynette, we, we will get to it. Uh, you, you certainly have a, a very interesting story. You you were born in Grenada, so I, I want you to begin by telling us about your Grenadian heritage and background. Yes, I, I was I was born and raised in Grenada. Um, my parents, uh, Curtis Hopkin and Curtis and Audrey Hopkin, they owned a, a very uh, small resort, hotel resort in Belmont. I am mm -hmm. very, very familiar with Belmont. And um, two of my brothers followed in my father's footsteps. Arnold Hopkin owns the Blue Horizons Garden Resort. And of course, my older brother, Sir Royston, who passed away, owned the, the Spice Island Beach Resort. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my late teens, I left Grenada to go to London, England, to college, and um, that's where I met my husband, and uh, did a lot of traveling through Europe, and got married in, in London, lived in Ireland for three years, where our first kid was born, then we lived in Jamaica, where two of our kids, other children were born, and um, then came to Canada, went to West Africa, Ghana, and uh, settled here for a while before ending up in Asia for three years. So um, I've, done a, I've done a lot of, of traveling and mm -hmm. I, had, uh, I, I, I had a lot of um, um, stories throughout all my travels that I accumulated that uh, made me... Um, think that it would be very good to share with other people, mm -hmm. especially uh, one of my aunts. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Good Protein. No. She, <laughs> you know, she's a little bit older than both of us. Mm -hmm. But uh, she made me promise her on more than one occasion that I would write a book. Mm -hmm. And uh, because my stories from all the different countries that I had visited, my letters in those days, they were, they, there was no such thing as a computer. And my letters would be from probably uh, two, three pages to 16 pages. <laughs> and quite a few people uh, actually saved my letters, which was um, very nice. and. Uh, those were the ones that kept pestering me that I had to do something like uh, putting them into book form. So oh. when I got to Asia, I got so much more information that I could compile with the rest of my stories that mm -hmm. made it even more unique that um, I focused then on definitely putting a book together. So this is your first book, yes? 
Yes, yes, it, it is. It's your first book. Okay, so so we, we, we will be expecting more from you. Yeah. <laughs> that be the plan? <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, so let us get let us get to the uh, the, the meat of the book. Uh, in the book, you talk about uh, and and certainly for those who have not read the book, I'm not going to give away the entire plot. Uh, every chapter uh, is is a specific storyline that's different yes, from the other chapter. chapter. It's a different story. Correct. But 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 you detail some very harrowing details about uh, uh, about this drug plant and being held against your will. Now, how did you manage uh, to end up in Asia in the first place? I my believe it's Malaysia. My husband, Michael, was sent to Malaysia on a three-year contract. Mm -hmm. He's a civil engineer. And uh, Malaysia, is a, it, it was the best, I think, Asian country for us, or country in Asia for us to, to do a contract in because the people are absolutely wonderful there. They're very friendly, Country. very cosmopolitan. And um, the food was fantastic, mm -hmm. very, very uh, reasonable. Actually, going into one of the food courts and ordering um, food, a array of food actually, was cheaper than going to McDonald's here in North America. <laughs> and um, the whole way of life was, was really unique and wonderful. And uh, this is why um, some of the wives and I decided to take the opportunity of visiting some of the other countries in Asia while our husbands were hard at work. And um, one of the things I hope that readers will get out of my book when they read my book is the, um, the I, I would like them to go on this imaginary, imaginary journey with me so they could see things through their mind's eyes so all the, to experience all the adventures and, and all the unique uh, experiences I had in, in Asia. And um, to also appreciate that um, no matter what part of the world um, we travel to, Every country has its own unique beauty. And um, this is something that I think a lot of people don't seem to, to um, focus on. And uh, we actually live in such a beautiful world. I think if we were able to um, recognize all the beauty around us in every country and every place, and learn to appreciate it better and live a better life towards uh, doing something like that, we really wouldn't have any need to start exploring sp space, the universe, to try and find another <laughs> another planet for us to move to. Right, or to colonize another planet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Focusing on doing that, focus on, on repairing and, and building what we have on mm -hmm. hand. Mm -hmm. But um, now how are you how are you treated as a black person in Asia? What were notions of race like for uh, for for Asians? I, I myself had the opportunity to to live and study in the Republic of China on Taiwan for four years. I speak fluent Mandarin uh, and so I, I had uh, issues around um, questions of my own color there as well and experiences around that. So what was that like for you? Well, China is very, very different from Malaysia because Malaysia is very cosmopolitan mm -hmm. it's, it, or multicultural, I should say, because it's made up of uh, the Malay, uh, the Chinese, uh, the Indians and other ethnic uh, groups. So for me, living in um, Malaysia, it was never, never an issue because the amusing side is most, a lot of the Malay people thought I was Malay. And often I'd get people coming and speaking to me in Malay, just assuming that I was from Malaysia. And um, then they'd be a little surprised and shocked when I, I said, I'm, I'm not, I speak English, you know? And then the other side of the coin would be the Indians who would assume that 
I was Indian. So my color was never an issue in, in Malaysia because I think too, there weren't that many black or colored people around Malaysia because they came on visits and left quite quickly. They um, didn't do the long-term contracts like Michael and I did there. So I, it, it was very warm. They were all extremely, extremely warm to me. Mm -hmm. That That is good to know. I never had the opportunity to visit Malaysia, but whenever the world opens up again and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we would, um, you know, definitely have a chance to do that. Uh, Bob Marisho is asking a question, Ms. Roka. He says, did they expect you to wear a chador in Kuala no, Lumpur? No, no, no. We just had to respect um, the, the, the society by not wearing shorts or uh, sexy plunging necklines and, and things like that, just to keep ourselves covered nicely. Because it's, it's, it's a predominantly Muslim country, it so more socially it conservative, is. yes? Yes, it, it, it mm -hmm. is. And um, the women, the, the Malay women, were always so beautifully dressed because mm -hmm. they, they wore the scarves over their heads, pretty scarves, um, uh, a blouse, a long, long blouse that covered the um, nicely colored um, skirts. So they, none of them wore the burqa across their faces or any black, uh, dressed in black. It was all very colorful and, and nice. Silks. Yeah, beautiful silks. All right. Um, so, um, like I said, the system, it was so laid back. It, mm -hmm. People are so wonderful. To me, it was like a home away from home because that's how they made me feel. And in, in Malaysia, the national pastime there is eating, eating and shopping. <laughs> so when you are greeted there, no one says good morning or good good afternoon. They ask if you're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have you taken lunch? Have you gone shopping? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. All right, Ms. Ruka, th this was a very uh, heartwarming conversation. Uh, certainly, I will be reading the book. Uh, my order is coming in from uh, Amazon. Uh, but for those of you in Grenada, uh, you can also obtain uh, the book. I believe it's at uh, Heart and Soul. You said that's the name of the... Uh, in the Grand Dance Mall. Yes, at, 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 at the Spiceland Mall there, down there in uh, Grand Dance. So, uh, Ms. Ruka, thank you again for appearing on the Burby Port, and you have a wonderful day. Thank you for having me on your show. Appreciate Absolutely. It. All right, folks, uh, stand by. We will be right back with the, our panel discussion for today. Lesbian, feminist, warrior, poet, mother, is named the state poet of New York. It means that we live in a world full of the most intense contradictions, and we must find ways to use the best we have, ourselves, our work, to bridge those contradictions, to learn the lessons that those contradictions teach. And that is the work of the poet within each one of us, to envision what has not yet been, and to work with every fiber of who we are to make the reality pursuit of those visions irresistible.
And welcome back, folks. Uh, as we indicated in the intro, we will be having a, a discussion around uh, Black History Month and celebrating uh, African Americans, uh, uh, really the, the, the experience of Caribbean Americans who contribute to the tapestry of, of American history, really. And I'm happy to be joined by Mr. Martin Felix, who is, who is an educator uh, in New York. Uh, he's also a Grenadian. Mr. Felix, welcome to the Bub Report. I am also happy to be joined uh, by uh, Cassie, uh, who is the director of the LGBTQ Dignity Project. She is a Jamaican American uh, who also is involved in a lot of civil rights activism here in uh, the Prince George's County, Washington, D.C. area. I also have the mayor of New Carrollton, Mayor uh, Felicia Nemrod. Uh, Madam Mayor, thank you for joining us. I know that you have a city to run, so I, I, I thank you for taking the time to join us here on the Bub Report. We do hope to be working with you uh, in the future. And uh, Miss Aisha Braveboy, who is the state's attorney for uh, the county of Prince George's here in uh, the state of Maryland. Uh, Ms. Braveboy uh, has some very deep Grenadian roots. Her dad uh, is Grenadian. And I know that my my deceased cousin, Rupert Ambrose, he actually uh, helped, he, you know, he, he really rallied around you during your election. So <laughs> it is finally good to put uh, a, a name, a face to the name rather, because he spoke a lot about you. So uh, I, I thank you panel for joining us. And, and what, what we want to do today is to really talk about the, the Caribbean American contribution to black history and what that looks like. And Mr. Felix, I will start with you. Why should Caribbean people care about Black History Month? Some may say, well, why is that relevant to us? Well, first of all, good morning and thanks for yes. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's our history. That's the most fundamental uh, point to be made in terms of why should we care about African-American history or African uh, History Month. I think that um, often it has missed the, uh, the, um, the intricate uh, connection between African-Americans and uh, our, um, you know, and the Caribbean um, um, uh, um, Africans. Um, I think we often forget that, for example, from the inception, the British ruled uh, its um, its American colonies, and I say American, I'm, I'm talking continental American, uh, as basically a, a, a single um, empire. So that, for example, while you had the 13 colonies up north, you had the 13 or more uh, island and uh, territories, colonies in the south, uh, including the Caribbean islands, uh, you know, Diana and, and so on, from time to time, more than uh, 13 colonies. And so, you know, people, ideas, goods were traded um, north, from north to south, south to north. Um, you know, ships were coming from, from uh, Africa and uh, letting people off in the Caribbean, uh, taking people from the Caribbean, taking them to the United States, and so on and so forth. Uh, it is um, recognized that 1619 is a landmark uh, year for, um, or was, uh, for uh, the African-American uh, history, um, you, know, um, you know, curriculum or, or chronology. But it is often missed too that these um, Africans that were first brought to um, to the United States through Virginia in 16, 1619, you know, they, they, they basically were coming to the Caribbean. And in fact, they were captured, um, pirate ships uh, captured them uh, very close to, um, to Mexico. Syracuse, Mexico, uh, between Mexico and Cuba, you know, so, and then they were captured and brought uh, to the United States. So from the inception, you had this kind of exchange and this kind of commonality. The first explorer, um, you know, some people question, you know, whether 1619 should be really used as this uh, landmark um, uh, event, because Africans were uh, enslaved in the Caribbean for like a hundred years uh, before. Um, but in any case, uh, you have explorers, for example, that were brought from the Caribbean to explore, of course, explore the, uh, you know, uh, Florida uh, area and uh, the, the Southwest United States, a very famous African uh, by the name of uh, Esteban, uh, Estebanico, uh, mm -hmm. he's called, but uh, he really was born in Morocco, was enslaved uh, in, uh, in Spain, 
and then brought to the Caribbean and then used uh, as an enslaved uh, explorer uh, to the Southwest. He was one of the few people that survived. He unfortunately uh, was, uh, was killed by Native American, I, I hesitate to say tribe, Native American nation uh, groups and so on and so forth. So it goes like, you know, this whole history uh, goes from the start even to the contemporary times. You know, we, we look at the various uh, areas of, uh, of human endeavor where Caribbean people excel. You know, Audre Lorde was featured in your, um, in your introduction here. Mm -hmm. Audre Lorde's, uh, Audre Lorde's uh, parents hailed from Karakou and uh, Barbados, mm -hmm. you know, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, even like in terms of middle history, you have, you know, people like, for example, some of the the early governors of um, of the of the southern states, like South Carolina, Georgia, and so on, were from uh, the Caribbean. At least uh, thirteen um, that I counted when I last checked, um, from the sixteen hundreds to the seventeen, the, the, the late seventeen hundred, came from directly from Barbados. Uh, Alexander so, Hamilton from Saint right, Kitts, from yeah. Saint Kitts, uh, from Nevis in particular. Nevis, yeah, mm -hmm. right. But you know, so this interconnection um, goes way back, you know, and uh, we often miss the fact that African American history is our history, and um, you know. African Americans actually have celebrated Caribbean history as their own as well. Mm -hmm. We should not forget that uh, when we, of course, got our emancipation, we wrestled our emancipation uh, first. So that, for example, African Americans were commemorated. Um, uh, West Indian, um, you know, uh, history um, was West Indian Liberation Day, West Indian uh, Emancipation Day. For example, Frederick Douglass's famous speech. You know where he talks about uh, there's no um, there's no progress without struggle. Mm -hmm. You know was in the context of speaking about uh, uh, West Indian um, you know emancipation. You know he says there's no struggle where there's no struggle there's no progress. Those who profess uh, to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. And you know he goes on to talk about the importance of the Caribbean um, emancipation project mm -hmm. and how it how much of an inspiration it is. And actually African-American communities throughout uh, the United States celebrated uh, Caribbean emancipation for quite some time. Mm -hmm. you know, so it goes back and forth. We were also inspired by various um, junctures of African-American struggles, which emboldened our own struggles in the Caribbean mm -hmm. island. And now let me, bring in, uh, let me bring in the rest of the panel here, uh, Ms. Brave Boy and uh, Mayor Rembrandt, uh, here in uh, Prince George's County, and I'll, I'll also bring in uh, Miss Murray there. Uh, here in, uh, you guys all serve in Prince George's County in different capacities and perform different roles. Uh, what do we think in, in context of uh, the immigrant community or the Caribbean immigrant community, uh, why should we stay engaged with, with the civic and political process? Why should we care? And any one of you can begin to answer. Well, I believe that we should care because as you have seen, history has been made all across the country, in our county, right here locally. And um, we need to show everyone that if we can, everybody else can. So mm -hmm. therefore we're teaching um, the younger youths uh, to emulate most of us endeavors and to be able to show uh, that what happened in the past don't necessarily mold the future. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. why I think we should stay engaged so we can uh, train our youths of how the future should be molded. And uh, Madam Mayor, you actually made history by being the first uh, black mayor of, of the city of New Carrollton, correct? Correct. So so tell us about that journey, that this, this Jamaican uh, immigrant who decided, Jamaican-American immigrant who decided to run for elections and actually win that uh, position of mayor? Well, the, the demographics in the city of New Carrollton was changing. And um, I do a lot with the community. I'm not a politician. Um, I am a community activist. So mm -hmm. we were doing a lot of work with the community and the parents decided to write me in for city council. And I, I got a strong uh, 
resistance. Uh, they told me straight up, you're not going to hold any place on this council. So for the first year, I had no position on the council. And then the second year, I moved from nobody on the council to chair of the council. And then the resident said, well, we're going to write you in for mayor. So I said, rather than to go through the process of the resistance again, let me just run the process through. And I run a rigorous campaign solely by myself at first. And then my family came in and we had other leaders in the community that came in to help. But um, we just wanted to show that, you know, if we're going to stand, we're going to stand strong and we're going to stand tall. Uh, Ms. Brave Boy, tell us about your, your your decision to get involved. I know you were involved in, in, in the political process or in community uh, service process for a while. Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me on this show. And it's great to be with um, Grenadians and Jamaicans and all of my uh, Caribbean family. So, um, you know, my father, um, Cuthbert Brave Boy, uh, really kind of, pushed me into politics. He was kind of uh, guiding me in that direction as fathers do. And oftentimes as daughters and sons probably as well, we resist uh, having our parents tell us what they think we ought to do. But my father told me that I, I should get involved in politics. I was a couple of years out of law school working for the federal government at the time. So I got involved with the campaign. My Godfather, um, uh, uh, Mr. Bridgman, Don Bridgman, um, was also working on this campaign. And so uh, we worked really hard, you know, got this individual elected. We, I went and worked for uh, the administration in my local government, and I was really excited to do so. And when the opportunity came to run for a um, state delegate, a state legislative position, I did. And I think it was then that I uh, saw just how proud of the Caribbean community was that me as a first generation, um, you know, was able to run and win successfully with a Grenadian last name, Brave Boy. No one can <laughs> kind of deny that name. Um, yeah. And so um, I think it encouraged, uh, you know, them and 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 their children to say, you know what, we can do it too. Um, and so it's been just an honor to not only serve as a delegate, but now as the top law enforcement officer in the county, you know, I, I recognize the unique uniqueness um, of kind of my story as being a first generation. It's very similar to so many um, young people growing up in the county, but they've not been able to look and see someone who may have come from their uh, similar background reach the highest levels of government mm -hmm. in their county. And to be able to see that, I think, is so powerful and so important. So I feel an extra responsibility, not only to perform my job, but also to create opportunities for others. And um, it's, it's, it's been awesome. <laughs> All right, uh, Cassie, Cassie, let me bring you in. Uh, you, you, you serve in an activist space, uh, shall we say, uh, with the LGBTQ Dignity Project. Why are you involved in activism? Okay, so for me, activism is very important. And the reason why I got involved in activism, I'm always an activist. Even growing up in Jamaica, I'm always there fighting for the rights of those who are less fortunate, especially being a part of the LGBTQ plus community. And um, coming here to the United States, I didn't know I would have to be such a strong advocate to, to fight for basic rights, right? And, um, you know, one of the things that I realized is that before I open my mouth and speak, I am just another Black person. Yes, and so the adversities that Black people go through in this country, we have to all come together and fight for the rights of us all, whether we, you know, whether we're Caribbean, whether we're African, whether we're African Americans, you know, we're all one and we're all from the same place. And the work that we're doing as activists is needed. And um, I feel so honored to know that I have people like, you know, the state's attorney who is from the Caribbean that's been there with us from day one, you know, fighting with us as advocates are surrounding the black LGBTQ community. And I'm very proud enough, Ms. Felicia Nemar, that has been one of the as being the first black mayor of the city of New Carlton. So I feel like community activism, all of us have to play our part 
in in this fight you know because we are I always say this and i really love a statement from um the former secretary Hillary clinton we're stronger together and sometimes you know we are oh you're caribbean you're different you know but at the end of the day we're all black people and we all have to be in this fight together in order to be successful because no one want to get up every day and fight for basic right but it's something we have to do and we have to continue this fight and community activism is very important to me and i will continue this fight going forward now last summer you were heavily involved in uh, the, the summer of protests over the the killing of uh, george floyd uh, I know that you guys had several events around uh, Prince George's County. Would you say that these uh, types of events bore any fruit? I mean, what came out of it? Definitely. So I think um, with Prince, so what started these um, events in Prince George's County is, um, you know, I woke up one morning, I'm like, all these stuff going on around in America. Prince George's County is known as a proud um most wealthy affluent african-american county in the country and uh, with all these things going on around the country you know there is not much activism in prince george's county surrounding police brutality surrounding all these stuff that happened so i was like you know we need to do something about it. and that's how it got started and um you know what i would like to see is um what my vision of that was to see community leaders, elected officials, citizens, everyone coming together and say, hey, we will not put up with this in Prince George's County. Yes, there's issues in Prince George's County. However, you know, I think it's a it's a great county, have a lot of potential to do a lot of stuff and live up to his name as being the most affluent African-American county in the country. And um, so the stuff that I see that came from this is awareness, is awareness of some of the stuff that happened right here in Prince George's County around police brutality. And also where a lot of the, the conversation, while it's a hard conversation, more people are having these conversations around issues surrounding police brutality, issues surround, surrounding um, it unjust. So I think it was a well needed start and um, even with the police reform task force, you know, I haven't gotten a chance to read through it all, but some of the stuff that I've seen, I know a lot of that came from us being out there as activists fighting for equality in the county. And, um, you know, I just want to always want to highlight people that are doing a good job when I speak. And the state's attorney, um, Aisha, Aisha Brave Boy, has been there with us. And, um, you know, she's always someone that you can reach out to, and she's always ready to pick the battle up and run. But one of the thing that I really pump this for me as well is the killing of black transgender women in the county. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just sad to see that so, so much unjust has been done to the black transgender people in the community. And um, there was no, there was no real focus on what happened. It was to me kind of swept under the rug and um, you know, we have people like, I know I keep on talking about state's attorney, but people have to get credit where it's due. Mm -hmm. She, you know, she stood with us and, you know, be there with us to make sure stuff, while she may not be able to prevent all from happening, but she at least step up and put herself out there to be an advocate to say, okay, what can I do for you? She, 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 we didn't have to keep on going to her. She, she said, what can I do for you? What can I do to help some of these things that are happening? So as a Caribbean person, I'm very proud to know that we have a state's attorney from the Caribbean that is stepping up and say, okay, you know what? I'm gonna get out there and I'm gonna make sure these things are not happening. Not just with the LGBTQ plus community. She, she has so many task force within her within her her state's attorney office to make sure you know everyone is treated fairly in the county and um so i think all that came you know while she was doing these things before the the, the george floyd movement started but i think it also helped to get her more support to know that these things are needed so uh, you know i always want to say thank you to miss bear because she she Took the but she took on the fight and she went with it and then with all this there's more people coming behind her to support so I love to see that Miss Brayboy you are the, the 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 chief law enforcement officer for the county and and police reform issues are 
are front and center in, in public conversations in the United States uh, in, in this period. Um, what kind of police reforms are you thinking about enacting in, in Prince George's County that would get us to a place where people of color, I mean, notwithstanding, yes, people, we know that Prince George's County is the a majority black county, but that does not escape the fact that there were instances of uh, police misconduct in the county as well. Oh, a absolutely. And let me just say, well, first of all, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, <laughs> let, let me just say that, you know, the, the activism on the ground really does help us as um, elected officials do our jobs not only better, but faster, because oftentimes government takes a while to move. It's a huge bur bureaucracy. You try to get everyone on board and everyone on the same page in order to make things happen. But I think there was a fierce urgency of now. And so we recognize that this was an opportunity. This was the time to make big, bold changes. And, you know, we did. And, and I think that the encouragement and support on the ground from organizations like Cassie's really helped focus us in on that and gave us all that courage to make it happen and to maybe ruffle some feathers while doing it, but knowing it's the right thing to do. So um, I can tell you that Prince George's County has had a history of uh, police brutality. We've had a history of police killings involving uh, young black men. And, um, and so historically, um, the, the issues around policing has absolutely uh, been relevant and significant in our county. And in fact, there was an MOU uh, that the county entered into back in the early 2000s as a result of some of the unfair practices of the department. And so uh, while that um, MOU with uh, the Justice Department ended uh, back in maybe, I think around 2000, maybe seven or eight or nine, um, there were problems that still persisted. And um, as state's attorney, I, you know, obviously don't run the police department. I don't appoint the officials in the department, but we are charged with holding them accountable. So I created a public integrity unit when I came into office. Um, we have, um, through that unit, indicted about 13 officers, not just Prince George's County Police, but we also have 24 municipalities, and most of them have police departments, whether they're relatively smaller or, or a little larger, mm -hmm. uh, like some. Uh, even, you know, in New Carrollton, there's a police department, so a miss, uh, Mayor Nimrod could probably talk to you a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that um, we have indicted officers for second-degree murder, uh, for sexual assault, for assault, for theft, for just a number of, uh, you know, crimes. And we say, and it is true, that the police are not above the law. And everyone but is- How many, I'm sorry, Ms. Bebo, but how many of these officers were convicted? Because so, you, so we've had, so under my unit, we've had yeah. two trials so far, because right now we're not having trials because of the, um, uh, of the pandemic. But in those trials, both of those officers were convicted, one of beating a homeless man and the other one of sexual assault. They were both convicted. Mm -hmm. And they, okay. one has served their, his time and the other one is serving a seven year sentence. So okay. it is, you know, we are very serious. And uh, we put on very, uh, we put on quality cases. Uh, we don't just indict officers because, you know, we want to. We do it because we have to. It's the right thing to do. And we put together uh, very, uh, you know, really good cases because that's what it requires. In order to be successful in court, you have to have evidence um, and you have to have competent attorneys who are arguing those cases. I have a very senior attorney who leads that unit and uh, I think we do a, a very good job. I can't say that in every case we're going to get a conviction, just like in every case against a, uh, a, a regular uh, civilian. We don't always get a conviction, but in the cases we have tried so far, we have gotten convictions. Um, but I can tell you that we always, before we indict a case, we always uh, determine whether or not we have sufficient evidence that we believe that we can prove our case beyond a reasonable doubt before we move forward. And so, and, and we do. Um, so in addition uh, to that unit and the great work that that unit is doing, we are also holding, uh, you know, um, uh, classes for our officers because ultimately we want them to be trained in Fourth Amendment and Fifth Amendment and use of force and public integrity and all of these things that we expect 
uh, them to deliver and, and to observe in terms of the law when it comes to relating to residents on our streets. And so we um, have a series of, of classes that we've been holding since the summer uh, with our police department and not just our county police, but also our municipal police are invited to attend as well. In addition to that, we're supporting legislation that will provide for further transparency because one of the things that we've run into and other state's attorneys around the state have run into is the fact that we don't always have the information within police files to determine whether or not uh, an officer, number one, should have been charged with a crime or number two, uh, has uh, is operating with integrity such that we uh, want to you know, have them testify in cases that they bring to the office. And so there's a lot of information that we are not getting, not just Prince George's County, but throughout the state. And uh, we, so I have testified in Annapolis uh, to support those bills that will uh, provide for greater transparency. Uh, and in addition to that, we're looking at, um, so we'll, I uh, testified in support of our speaker, Adrian Jones, who's our first woman, first African-American speaker uh, for the House of of delegates in Maryland. Uh, she has a very aggressive uh, police reform bill, which I testified in support of, uh, that would get a rid of the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights, which protects uh, officers uh, a, a lot from mm -hmm. disclosing information and things like that. But it but that bill also addresses the issue of use of force and creating a universal use of force standard, looking at the use of no-knock warrants, uh, looking at how trial boards uh, for officers are, are created. And, and so we are, uh, there, there are some amendments that we think are important to that bill. We've shared that with the speaker, but by and large, this is a good bill. It's a very aggressive bill, but it is what is needed at this time. And so through legislation and through actions and through, you know, my office living up to our duty and our responsibility, uh, we believe that we can uh, work to make our county uh, and at least the administration of justice and what we see on our streets with our officers a better experience for everyone either living in or traveling through our county. And I did want to mention that our, our county executive did um, put together a police reform task force. They uh, provided 50 different um, recommendations and her administration has accepted 46 of them. And so we're looking forward to the implementation of those recommendations as well uh, that would create er, like an early warning system or really they had an early warning system, but it wasn't utilized properly. But for those officers that present a problem for our community, it's an uh, they will be identified earlier so that they can either be retrained or, quite frankly, removed if they need to be uh, so that they don't cause problems uh, for our community. So uh, we, we're going through a lot of reform. Um, there's, you know, it, it, there's going to be tension with that because a lot of changes are going to be made. Uh, but it but it is a must at this point. Uh, we can't hide behind the fact that this is the way things have always been done, because clearly that wasn't good enough. All right, uh, Ms. Brayboy, uh, thank you for that. And Ms. Mr. Felix, I want to get, I want to get, give you the opportunity to respond to a question from Dixie and Purcell. Uh, she's saying, "I'm sorry to say that I, but I don't believe that in the celebration of Black History Month, being black is something to celebrate every day. I don't think anyone is disputing that. So why is it a month is designated to celebrate my heritage, my history, my way of life, my living?" that things are supposed to be celebrated every day. Again, I don't think anyone is disputing that, but uh, can, you, can you give us a sense as to why we have Black History Month in the first place? Well, I, I think it's, it's a good question. Um, I, I think that it, it really comes from a place of, um, of neglect. You know, uh, oftentimes, you know, you say, you know, is, in terms of relationships, you say, you know, someone take you for granted, like, you know, you say, oh, I love you every day. You know, there's no special um, case for us recognizing when we met or whatever. It's the same thing, you know, like some people use the uh, the analogy or the metaphor of a bad relationship between, you know, like someone involved in a bad relationship in terms of the relationship of the United States uh, government or the country and uh, black people. You know, it's <laughs> it's one of those things whereby like, you know, you feel that you've taken for granted. Uh, uh, historically, African-American studies were, were not, um, you know, included in the curriculum. And I think people that move from one place to another, I think 
they obligated to really do some research uh, and background. I think like a lot of immigrants sometimes, because we come from a, a, um, a black majority place, sometimes we have a certain, it's sort of like, I don't know, I don't want to call it arrogance, but it's sort of like, you know, okay, why do we have to, to have a special month for African-American history? But, you know, Trinidad celebrates uh, Black History Month as well. Um, you know, uh, uh, in, in the UK, uh, Black History Month is also celebrated. What I will, what I will really love is if every country, uh, every of the diaspora countries, every of the black majority countries have a, a particular Black History Month. And just like how we go to carnival and celebrate carnival in each other's territories, we can have a focus on particular countries in terms of their unique history every, um, the month that they choose. You know, for example, Trinidad, I think uh, Black History Month in Trinidad is November, right? So if Grenada has, let's say August or, or July, you know, everyone can focus on the, the unique contributions of Grenadians uh, in that particular territory and so on and so forth. But I think it's very important uh, that our history, like for example, I, I, I realized that there's a, there's a drive to make history uh, mandatory in Caribbean schools. And perhaps it's it's a really uh, an understatement because it actually is mandatory. What is not mandatory is our people's history, uh, the history of resistance, uh, women's history, LGBTQ history, for example, in uh, the case of the sister that, uh, that you know, is part of this uh, panel as well, in terms of her emphasis on the, the actual activities of that particular uh, civil rights um, struggle. Um, and so on and so forth. So uh, oftentimes we take for granted uh, that things will be done uh, without there, there being some kind of emphasis or some kind of focus on it. And I think that that's part of the, the error that um, Carter G. Woodson and the other founding fathers of Black History Month try to, uh, try to resolve. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I, I felt that that was a, a very thorough response. Uh, folks, stay with us. Uh, we will come back to wrap up uh, the program, but we will uh, now go to a, a quick uh, clip here from one of my, one, one of my favorite people, uh, Nina Simone. Stand by. We'll be right back. I think what you're trying to ask is, uh, why am I so insistent upon giving out to them that blackness, that black power, that black pushing them to identify with uh, 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 black culture. I think that's what you're asking. It, it, I have no choice over it in the first place. To me, we are the most beautiful creatures in the whole world, black people. I mean, and I mean that in every, every sense, uh, outside and inside. And to me, we have a culture that uh, is surpassed by, 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 by no other civilization, but we don't know anything about it. So again, I think I've said this before in the same interview, I think uh, at some time before, my, my job is to somehow make them curious enough or persuade them by hook or crook to get more aware of themselves and where they came from and what they are into and what is already there and just to bring it out. This is what compels me to compel them. And I will do it by whatever means necessary. That was uh, Nina Simone, Nina Simone, uh, activist, an artist, a musician, uh, and uh, as I said before, one of my favorite people. Uh, so now I will give the panel an opportunity to wrap up. Moving forward, there are several issues that affect uh, the black community that, 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 that needs to be addressed. We're talking about uh, from the death rate with respect to COVID-19, the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on the African-American community, uh, issues around uh, police brutality. Uh, there are issues... Uh, around uh, uh, economic and, and income inequality. There, there are several issues that are affecting the community. So moving forward, and I'm going to bring the mayor back as well. Uh, what what does the next year look like for, 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 for you folks? Uh, uh, Ms. Braveboy, do you want to start? Well, I think the mayor was trying to, uh, 
Oh, Mayor, you go ahead. Yes. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, for the next year, what I see is happening is that we have to uh, continue to strategically plan and push forward whatever we are planning into existence. Uh, like, for instance, in the city of New Carlton, uh, I, I jumped on the bag wagon with uh, Cassie and Aisha Brabo and other in talking about uh, police reform. Uh, I didn't quite go as aggressive as to defund the police. What we did was to reallocate the resources um, into areas to more benefit the community. Uh, so we have um, an officer that is our community resource officer that's already been in place, but we also added another person that is going to bridge the gap between uh, the police and the community. So that person would not be in uniform, but would more be um, uh, easily recognized as one of the community um, engagement specialist person and will be able to help us with things like um, truancy, which we, we, because of COVID schools are not in session as of yet, but it will also help with domestic violence, abuse on women, abuse on um, anybody that is associated, um, any hate crime towards the LBGTQ or any other division, how we treat or black young uh, men and women. Um, people that drive through our community should feel safe. Uh, so racial profiling, all those things we are taking into consideration. So we are getting more involvement with our community. So in the next uh, year, I'm gonna see more um, uh, transparency with our police department. Um, our chief made it as soon as he knows what my plan was in place, he ran with it. And all the entire command staff, they're making things where uh, people can come out and see uh, active shooter. When would you shoot? When don't you shoot? Uh, some of the training that our officers are getting, they're going to also see that. Instead of having like one time training on excessive use of force, we're having multiple training on excessive use of force. We're making it a monthly issue where the communication are in the brains of our police officers that what we're going to tolerate and what we're not going to tolerate. So they have already instituted what they're going to do. And that's in line with my mission and vision to make sure there's transparency in our department. And I can assure you that some of the things that are happening in our county and in the country is not going to happen in New Carlton because we have already set the stage of what we want to happen. And that's what we're working on uh, for the next year. Also, we are trying to get more inclusive into our government. And with the last election, we have seen what has happened. And I know with all the cultural and all that is happening in our state and in our county, people are paying attention. So the first thing I did when I came in, we removed uh, the statue of Charles Carroll immediately. And we got a little bit of backlash on that, but I wanted them to know that anybody that uh, believed in slavery, anybody that pushed in Maryland to abolish slavery, but still kept a hundred slaves, we're not gonna tolerate that either. So the, the residents are speaking and I'm acting. And we just, in the next year, we're gonna do a lot of upsetting of uh, changes in the city. And I just want people to know it's not just my belief, but the majority speak. And we are going to make sure that black and brown people feel welcome in the city of New Carlton. And we're going to make sure that when they speak, that it doesn't fall on deaf ears, they are heard. Uh, Ms. Brave Boy, final comments from you. Sure, I think that uh, one of the things that we need to do now, and maybe um, uh, I can work with Ms. Nimrod on this to begin these conversations, is to really begin to uh, talk to communities and police about how communities want to be policed. You know, Sir Robert Peel, who is uh, believed to have developed nine principles of, of policing, one of them uh, it says that the police police with the consent of the community. And, um, and so, th so that police should never 
feel like they are coming in uh, and, and doing something that the community does not want them to do. The community absolutely wants safety. The co community absolutely wants people to be held accountable, but also the community wants to be treated fairly. And what does that look like? And so I think we need to begin to kind of go back to that type of principle, which is let's have those dialogues about how your community expects to be uh, treated uh, by law enforcement agencies uh, and, and have that dialogue about why law enforcement agencies kind of do certain things, uh, you know, what if they have like special operations or if they have, you know, suppression teams or this and that, why are they doing that? What does that mean for your community? What does it look like? Um, and, and what are they being trained to do such that they don't infringe upon the constitutional rights of the people and the civil rights of the people in that community? Um, but, but really having those conversations are key because I kind of sit in the middle and hear both sides. On the one hand, absolutely, we must ensure that uh, people in our community are being treated fairly and, and constitutionally. On the other hand, police have a job to do because there are people, unfortunately, out there committing very, uh, very serious crimes. But I don't think that you, we have to sacrifice constitutional uh, policing and policing, uh, respecting the civil rights of people and being respected by those who are policing our communities. I don't think we have to sacrifice that for safety. And I think that through dialogue, community, and police can kind of come together and really talk about what the expectations are. Um, and, and so I, I'd love to start having those conversations. And I think starting with a place like New Carrollton would be great um, because I think that's really what, what will move us uh, to that next level where there is that real trust between uh, law enforcement and our communities. All right, uh, Cassie, some final words. <laughs> Yes. Oh, so for me, what I would like to see, you know, continue is um, I want to see more collaboration with community leaders, elected official, and um, you know, go to the, go to the people, see what the problems are, because um, you know, for me, Black history is as a caring person, I'm a very proud Black lesbian woman, and Black history is very important to us all. We have so many great people from the Caribbean. We have Malcolm X, we have Colin Powell, we have Shirley Chris Holm, who was the first black woman to actually run for president in the United States. You know, and um, to see the adversities that African Americans face. And um, I'm so proud to know that as a Caribbean American person, I'm able to contribute to some of the solutions you know, I think we all need to come together and come to a mutual place and all sit at the table. You know, and yes, there's going to be disagreement, but we have to figure a way to come to middle ground. And um, because I always say it takes everyone. It, it takes even the common person on the street, you know, listen, understand where people are coming from. And that way we can actually come to a better place. And, um, you know, as a for me, I want to see more done for Black LGBTQ people of color in Prince George's County um, and around America, of course. Because one of the things here in, in the county, we need some resources for the Black LGBTQ plus community, especially Black trans women. In, in the schools, we need to see more done in terms of, you know, bullying in terms of discrimination, because once it starts there with a the younger generation, then we can actually mold them from there in order to create a better society. And, um, you know, and um, there's a program from the state's attorney office, a diversion program itself, locking up, you know, these, especially these black trans women who are out there for survival because they have nowhere to turn to. So they get on the street and they become sex workers. And then they are locked up. Some of them are actually being sex trafficked. But, you know, they feel like it's the only hope. They drop out of high school, they don't have a formal education, but it's survival is the game. So once, you know, we can all come together and listen and create an environment where all is treated equally, I think that we will have a step 
in the right direction and we can continue moving forward. I always say this, you know, and I'm a proud black Jamaican lesbian woman and I will wear that everywhere I go. I wear it at work, in the community, wherever, because that's who I am. And I'm gonna continue to be proud. But before anything else, I'm black. The first thing they see when they see me is a black woman that dress more on the masculine side. And this is what I wanna leave you with. And, I, and I, I've just written on a piece of paper and it's in my wallet, it don't leave me. It's always say, this is a quote from Marcus Garvey. He said, the color of my black skin it's not a badge of shame, but a symbol of national greatness. And today, the last day of Black History Month, I want everyone to understand that our black skin, a symbol of national greatness, and we need to wear it proudly and keep moving forward together and help each other, love each other, come together. If there's, we, we can disagree, but we shouldn't be out there fighting each other. We should be coming together and move forward together as one black people. All right, Mr. Mr. Felix, you've you've heard a, a mouthful there. You've heard a lot. You've been sitting there and waiting in the wind. So I'm going to give you a, an opportunity to put a bow on everything that we were discussing this morning. No, great stuff, great stuff. I really um, I'm inspired by the the, uh, the 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 activist struggle, the legislative struggle uh, by Sister Brave Boy, the uh, the uh, gubernatorial, the um, the municipal struggle that uh, uh, Mayor uh, uh, is, is actually. Um, helping to carry out it seems like there's a there's a sort of synergy that that is taking place between uh, these three sisters in, in that particular struggle and i think that um you know it's, it's more than welcome one of the things that I, I think that we need to focus on is you know the african-american history month is also a time of focus right so basically they have themes and the theme in uh 20 um 20 um 2020 was the, the, uh, the black vote right 2021 is the Black family, um, uh, and it also addresses the diaspora. You know, I think mm -hmm. it's uh, um, identity, uh, diaspora, and something else. Uh, but but in uh, 2022 is going to be on uh, health and welfare, mm -hmm. and so in this time of the as we emerge, uh, you know, into the pandemic, I don't want to say out. Um, you know, it's taken different form. We hope, hopefully, out. We have to be a bit optimistic that we will focus on the health and welfare of the the community. We are facing the, an existential crisis. Um, I think part of that whole uh, issue of um, uh, the dignity and health of the black family uh, is the issue of reparations. We cannot lose uh, sight of the 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 the. Uh, the importance of reparation uh, that will actually inform all of these struggles and actually um, help in the various ways in which we're trying to uh, to survive. Uh, one of the things that marked our presence in the Americas is uh, resilience, right? And um, I think one of the, the 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 ways in which I think it will be good to wrap all of this up is to show that the various struggles are, you know, part of this ongoing struggle from the time we first landed. Uh, on the uh, plantation. Um, of course, our history didn't begin uh, with slavery. We have a great African history that we need to begin to explore. But from the time we landed on the uh, plantation, we were resistant. And this continues even today. Today, the struggle of reparation is one of the things that unites um, uh, the African-American and the Caribbean struggles, right? In the United States, there's the HR 40, uh, House of Representative bill that basically uh, is uh, being invigorated apparently, uh, we hope, during the Biden administration. In the Caribbean, we have the uh, CARICOM 10-point agenda uh, uh, on reparations, right? These are some of the things that we need to focus on, um, as well as the other struggles, uh, not to minimize that. But mm -hmm. I think Grenada in particular needs to really up the ante on reparations. Uh, the the, the uh, St. Lucians are very, very active. The Jamaicans are very active. Um, you know, there's a lot of activity in, in places like Barbados and Trinidad, right? Of course, we need improvement in all of these areas, but it seems like Grenada has not really started uh, the reparations um, 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 agenda as yet. Uh, it's just what it seems to me. I'm not hearing anything. I'm not seeing anything much happening in that regard. So I think that we need, there's one of the ways, as I said, we can unite the uh, African-American struggles and the Caribbean struggles. The reparations issue, we need to uh, put it back on the uh, front burner. 
Mr. Felix, thank you so much. And let me thank the rest of the panel, Ms. Brave Boy, uh, Ms. Murray, uh, Mayor Nimhard, and Mr. Felix again. Thank you all so much for agreeing to appear on the Bub Report for this uh, Black History Month uh, episode. And I, I certainly hope uh, that we can continue okay. to, to see you again on, on future programs. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you guys. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, listeners and viewers, let me thank you again for uh, tuning in to the Bub Report for another week. We will be seeing you next week. We will be having uh, some programming around uh, trade union activism. There is a lot of uh, trade union activism right now happening in Grenada over uh, the 4% increases. The same in uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we're hoping to get uh, some of the trade union activists uh, to discuss uh, the the objectives of, of, of their struggles in those parts. So let me again, on behalf of the producers of the Bub Report, thank everyone for joining us and you guys have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.